Okay, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, we're delighted to have with us today Bob Dillman, uh, who lives here in Bellingham. He's got a master's degree in environmental resource engineering from Humboldt State University, a university not unlike Western, uh, in the, uh, uh, the Redwood Rainforest of Northern California. Uh, and he spent 20 years uh, working at the interface between financing and uh, climate change. And he's going to talk about some of those issues today. So Bob, thanks for coming. So uh, first of all, thanks to David. This is the first time I've ever done this. So uh, you guys get to walk through all my mistakes with me. Um, so um, I am going to walk through a lot of topics here. And uh, my, most importantly, I want to engage in some conversation with you guys. Um, my, my, my goals here, my goals for the discussion is, first of all, I'd like to, I really want to enlist a few of you folks to take on a project uh, going forward. And it's an important project. And so I'm going to start with kind of building a case. First of all, I'll show you guys a little bit of credibility, like what I've done, uh, and not so much about me, but about the possibilities of what you can do. And, and as a person that doesn't really have any particular 
like strong background in anything, you'll see that I've been able to do some things just by my intuition and, and, and through my relationships. Um, then I'm going to walk you through you know, some climate change issues, uh, the history of uh, Western and uh, some of the things that the Western has done in respect to climate change. And then walk you through some economic arguments, which will be fairly over, much of an overview, nothing uh, super heady. Um, uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about what our, our possibilities are for the, uh, uh, for the project. So what I'd like to do is have someone pass these out uh, along the way here. Um, do me a favor and, and, and keep your last page, because uh, I'm going to ask you, as you look through it, don't obviously go through the presentation. Um, you can, I'll walk you through that. But the last page is a questionnaire, and I, it's pretty simple, uh, pretty straightforward. Um, I'd like you to circle three things, and I'd like to have somebody that wants to volunteer to account for it, maybe someone on that side. So fill them out as I'm speaking, and uh, pass them down, and I'd like to get a tally. Uh, Pretty simple as you mentioned. Um, so, quick background. Uh, born in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, many years ago. Uh, went to Miami of Ohio, undergrad in marketing, uh, minor in finance, not there, and I wasn't a particular scholar. Um, getting a 2.8 grade point average from Miami of Ohio didn't do much back then except for get you a degree and allow you to move into the workforce, which I did. Um, and uh, after a few years, I realized that uh, I was more of a relationship-driven guy, and I worked my way into, into finance, which is what I do now. And uh, my, the short story is I finance medical equipment for hospitals. Very relationship-driven, but I work on fairly large transactions, and I work with people on a regular basis over and over. So it's a, very much of a trust business that I'm in. Um, it's pretty much hardcore capitalism, but I've worked it out so it represents my, my ideals um, as far as how I work. Um, Got a teaching credential. Uh, in the midst of that, I never left the country until I was about 31, and I backpacked around the world for a year, sold everything I owned, and that got me a, a much greater understanding of the way the world works and saw some different things, and it really is what drives me now, because I have a very global approach, that, um, as well as a local approach as far as how I do things. I got into finance. Um, in my 20s and then got back into it um, after my teaching credential when I realized that uh, uh, poor Bob Dillman wasn't going to help anybody out. Um, and after 9-11 kind of wiped me out, I, I started back up at, at 40 and uh, um, have you know, stayed in that business now and decided to stay in finance so I can do all the other things that I do in, 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 uh, uh, in parallel. So I've been at this company for 11 years now and a lot of things I'm going to talk about I've done while I worked for this company. Uh, and they've allowed me to do all the fun stuff I get to do on the side. Um, and from an international standpoint, um, I'll talk about my grad work in a second. Uh, I've done some international work, uh, uh, both in uh, Nicaragua and Guatemala and um, in Mexico. Uh, and it's really helped me have a better understanding of the, the issues that are um, happening around the world, and, and certainly with respect to what's going on here in, uh, in Bellingham. Um, First of all, like I said, I want to build some credibility with you folks you, so you understand that I, I, I do know what I'm, I, I do have background in talking about the, these topics. Um, my background is, like I said, I've probably done about half a billion dollars in transactions in my, in my career. And, and that seems like it is a large number, but, um, but I've done it without spreadsheets, which is, might be strange for some of you guys, but of course that's probably because spreadsheets weren't around when I first started. Um, and, uh, and most of it's based on personal relationships. So um, when you're in finance, with in, in, in big ticket finance, uh, it's very much a one-on-one -on -one type of a, a thing. And so I, I understand the big macro part of the world and how the, the way the uh, economics work. Oh, by the way, any questions, anytime, raise your hand. This makes it a lot easier. We're gonna have a hopefully interactive Q&A at the end. Um, in 2010, actually in 27, 2007, I went back to uh, Humboldt State and. I got a. Um, I started in um, with uh, as a master's in environmental resource engineering. When I started, I was a guy in my early 40s with no background in engineering, no background in economics, nothing, and I had this idea about microfinance and small clean energy. And uh, I wrote a, a paper about it actually, or not even a paper, an email to my friend in Guatemala that was working down there. Still the same guy I went down to work with last last year. Um, about possibilities, what could happen. You know, I had this intuition about things that could happen. And uh, does anyone know who Kiva is? Can you tell everybody what, what Kiva does? Um, 
They've got a lot of great press. They're on Oprah and all that stuff. And so, I uh, I need to. I was volunteering for an organization, a, a magazine, before I started grad school. Uh, this this uh, international youth development magazine for uh, supporting the empowerment of women and children, which is still around, by the way. The World Pulse. They're pretty amazing. Um, and I learned about microfinance, and uh, and I got accepted to grad school. And I went down for a ten day class in in Mexico, in Chiapas, uh, which is a, a poorest state in Mexico. And I went down there, and I. Uh, um, I saw, we learned about small clean energy technology, solar, biogas, water, and I was like, you know, I'm, again, I'm not a genius, so I go by simple, and I'm like, hmm, small loans, small technology, why is nobody doing this? So I wrote this paper about, you know, not even understanding the economic component of the, of the technology, um, about what it would look like to create this model, to be able to funnel money um, into energy projects and couple the finance with the actual project. Now. Is, what is your name? Jenny. Jay, as Jenny said, you know, you can kind of choose what you're, what you're doing, but you're, you're, Kiva learns money. They don't actually control where the money's going, per se. I mean, it, the, the families or the business put up the money online, and then you pick and choose. But, but essentially, it's kind of whatever they want to do with it. So my idea was, well, let's model it, and let's connect it with particular technology, so it's a one-stop shop of money and technology. So. Anyway, the, the, the chairman or the founder of Kiva blew me off and he kind of laughed at me and said, we have other focus, you know, you're just some grad student finance guy. So I made it my mission and I went to grad school. I started writing papers and learning about it and going to conferences and all the while going back to Kiva, you know, and trying to get a foothold in there and have them push my ideas and they shoved me off, shoved me off, shoved me off. So I wrote my thesis, which is all about small clean energy and microfinance in developing countries and the economic and empowerment aspect of it and all that. It's, 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 it's a big thesis. It would, it's definitely good reading material at night if you want to go to sleep. Um, and uh, and what, what, I, what I focused on was, again, on, on coupling those two and creating a model, that uh, create a sustainable model within the communities to continue this technology to, and, and the money throughout the community. So finally, I, I wrote my thesis, finished it, graduated. We started a company in Mexico at the same time with biogas. And you can still, Sistema Via Bolsa, you can still go online there. Um, they, they have an ongoing company putting biogas into the communities. Does anyone know what biogas is? Okay, a biodigester turns pig waste into methane gas for cooking. So methane gas is a horrible climate change gas. It's, it's 21 times worse than carbon dioxide. So just pig waste or pig, you know, you're, you, that's what you do when you, when you fart, it's methane, right? And so you can cook with that. And so there's a big bag that is manufactured that can take the waste and over 30 days it turns it into gas. So I coupled the finance with the, uh, with the, with the, the project. I was an initial investor. I was all the while doing my job and the grad stu student stuff and was working with these guys to put together this company. I started the company and um, these guys did an amazing job, won all these awards in Mexico. And I kept going back to Kiva and I'm like, guys, what's up here, you know? And I finally said, you have not only the capability, but the responsibility to move into green loans. They had some half-assed routine of getting into it before they didn't do it. So finally, in 2012, so I was out of grad school, you know, doing my thing, we signed an agreement. Normally, Kiva will they'll actually lend the money through banks. They're called microfinance organizations, but for lack of a better term, they're banks in these communities, in these rural communities. 
And they signed, we signed an agreement to lend money through Sistema Via Bolsa. We were the first company in the world that was not a microfinance organization. So we you know, took that idea all the way through start to finish. Again, I knew nothing about any of that stuff and figured out how to weave through it and we got it done. And today, in fact, last week, I, I lent money through Sistema Via Bolsa for a biodigester in, in, uh, in Mexico. I got out of the organization. It just wasn't working for me long term. I had other goals. So the, the one, of, one of the owners, one of the partners, was a, his dad was a rich Mexican, so he got my, my money out and, and, uh, and I moved on to some other things, um, which was, uh, uh, I'll tell you about in a second. And so, um, anyway, the, the, the goal of that story is to tell you that, you know, you don't always have to know everything about a project. Understanding how to ask the right questions and work with the right people and having the right intentions for what you're trying to do uh, can have you move through um, a process and, and, and you know, affect change in the world. And, and this project I'm talking about is, is something that's, that is uh, very similar to that. Um, I put www.csolutions.org up there. That's a good friend of mine that runs that organization. He's a phenomenal man. I was down there and I worked, did my day job from Guatemala last year for six months. And um, Greg has organizations in several countries, but their model is micro consignments. So instead of send, lending money, they lend goods and services to these communities. So, for example, um, uh, water filters is a big deal, clean water in, in Guatemala. So instead of like lending money to a, a, an entrepreneur, they lend the, the water filters and then they pay them back as they sell them to the community. Okay. Greg was a Peace Corps volunteer, got into that, stayed with it, and has built an incredible organization. So if you have any interest in international work, uh, check out that, that organization, it's, it's run very well. Um, yeah, in addition to being able to have this conversation, um, I really can give you a very good um, understanding of both sides of the economic perspective. So I understand, as I talk about um, our housing issue here in, in, uh, in Bellingham, I'm a, I'm a homeowner, you know, and I do, I do rent my, part of my property out. And I've done a lot of work on my property to, to make it you know, pretty, pretty sustainable, for lack of a better term, knowing that that's a overused term. Um, so I'm, I do look at things from both sides of the spectrum, and I can answer those questions as we walk through it. Okay, so we, st we really want to talk about is climate change. Uh, I, like I said, we didn't even, even in my teaching credential, we weren't even talking about it 15 years ago. Um, if you don't know the issues, you need to know them. Uh, it's, it's really the single greatest issue facing your generation. Now, you may have a you know, other little issues amongst you know, in your life that are super important, um, everything from economic disparity uh, to um, homelessness to um, hunger in the world to you name it. But all those issues in the, in the world, in the United States, are going to be exacerbated by climate change. Because all the decisions people have made in the past as far as how they live their, their life, the food they eat, the travel, their families, are going to be affected. And so it, it, not understanding the, the, um, the ramifications of your actions on a daily basis as, as, as with respect to consumption um, is, is probably not a good thing. So educate yourself on your choices. And, and again, this is part of the theme I'm, I'm going to walk you through here. Uh, I'll put this, this stat in here that kind of blows my mind. You know, the U.S. world population is 5% of the world and our consumption is 20%. So if the rest of the world started consuming like we do as Americans, we pretty much cease to exist tomorrow. We wouldn't have the water, the food, uh, any, any resources to be able to survive. So our job as Americans is not necessarily to try to change the world with technology per se, but to maybe modify our behavior as such to, to better understand the impacts of those behavior choices going forward. You gotta start somewhere though. Does anybody know what the, what the Western Sustainability Fund that, that is? Okay. Why don't you tell everybody what that is? Well, um, it's, it was started a while back um, by a fellow campus called Students for Renewable Energy. Um, and I think it started with um, uh, offsetting our energy use, mm -hmm. so like we buy credits. Mm -hmm. And uh, now it's like a program where we uh, we like start pilot projects to promote sustainability on campus. Right, right. If you think, I think it was 2007 when the students voted uh, to basically tax themselves to buy renewable energy credits or buy green energy, which is that's a, that's how that's calculated. I mean, it's kind of a little bit heady, but um, it, it, it's, um, it, that's, that's pretty groundbreaking when you think about it. If you think about it, and that's, part of that is part of my, my, my discussion as far as the collective nature of what you guys can accomplish as students and how you have this 
amazing opportunity as a student population in, in, in a very simple format to affect change in the community and the planet by aggregating your, your ideologies and, and, your, uh, and your consumption habits. Um, the, uh, how it could play in this scenario is, I've talked to Seth, uh, I don't think he's here. I just wanted to add, I was uh, from college back then here, and 82% of our students Paper. That's pretty amazing. That's pretty amazing. That's awesome. I mean, I when I was a sophomore in college, I mean, there was stuff going on with apartheid in South America, and I was just clueless. You know, I mean, I was one of those people that I was focused on something else, right? And, and it wasn't really in my face to understand you know, what was going on in the world. And that's pretty amazing to have that as a student population. And Western is. You guys are lucky. This is a pretty awesome uh, town, and obviously, I love Bellingham. Um, and um, but the university has some really good ideas and, and, and is a great vehicle for you to explore some of your ideas um, going forward. So how would play in this scenario? Um, like I said, I'm going to walk you through some, some ideas that I have and I'm looking for some people that really want to take this on and I can help move you through the system and um, ideal, um, ideally I'd like to uh, have a plan to approach you know, a couple professors and make this a project um, the, the sustainability fund has, has cash available for this. Um, we can find your money. Uh, folks at Sustainable Connections, I'm very uh, good friends with Derek, the director there. Derek and I kind of kicked around this idea of a, um, of a sustainability index for landlords, per se, and, and using the student population as a driver to, to affect change in the community. So let's talk a little bit about numbers and economics. Okay. The, um, <clears throat> this is a big thing. Most people don't really understand this. Uh, give me an idea, of average, what you guys pay monthly. If you live off campus, who lives off campus? All right, well, that helps. Give me an average of monthly what you pay. Tell us some numbers. Four fifty. Four fifty. Four ninety. Okay, so between four and five hundred, something. Um, you get twelve months out of the year. You know, eleven thousand off campus students, must plus or must, must or minus, um, for five hundred bucks. That's a 60, actually, those numbers are $66 million annual economic impact of the community. That's staggering. You are really the single most, like, uh, I guess, you probably have the biggest impact as a group, certainly on housing, other than, you know, developers, uh, within the community. That's a tremendous amount of power. Uh, and and, and let's, let's, let's talk a little bit about how, how you go ahead and make your decision, right? Okay, and, I, and you can stop me if I'm wrong and chime in because I'm, I'm going back in time. You come in as a freshman, you know. Before, another thing, first of all, how many people parents pay for summer or all of the college? Okay, how many people parents pay for none of their college? Okay. So the baby boomers are the richest population in the world. Okay. The children of the baby boomers might be the second richest population in the world. And so there are choices that are made on a daily basis that you make that are sometimes informed choices, sometimes not. Sometimes it's your money, sometimes it's not. But being able to make those choices uh, based on uh, whatever parameters you decide is super important because you're understanding how those choices affect your community. And as a moving population through this community, you see this big bubble of cash moving through the community and how it can impact uh, based on your decision-making process. So as freshmen, I'll paint a picture. As freshmen, you, you come and you're, you know, right out of bushy tail, and you're trying to figure out either who the cute guy or girl is next to you, and what you got yourself into, and how long till you can drink legally, and, um, uh, and where you want to live, and you probably live in the dorms. Now, you get into your sophomore year, and you're like, oh, I want to get a great place. It's got to be cheap. My parents gave me this budget. Maybe it's got to be close to campus. Maybe I'll, I've got some new friends. Uh, and then you get into a place, uh, and then, your junior year, you're like, well, either I'm keeping my friends or not, or maybe I want a place closer, or maybe my parents increase my budget. But the parameters are such that you, you may stay in that place for all the rest of your time, or you may be making decisions based on economic reasons, um, and you're maybe finding a sweet place that someone tells you about and you're able to move in. But these choices are pretty, pretty large, and if you stay with someone with a landlord for three years, I mean, that's a pretty long relationship, right? And you're paying a lot of money over those three years. It's your single raise expense after your tuition, right? Okay, so, so that decision-making process 
what I'm, what I'm trying to do is get an idea how we can modify that decision-making process to educate your, your, yourselves and your, and your classmates and the student population as far as the ramifications of those decisions. So the Community Energy Challenge, anyone knows, know what that is? Jenny, again, go ahead. Right. What, what they do is they, you can go get an energy audit and they'll come in and tell you how, many ways to outfit your home, whether it be energy efficiency upgrades, you know, insulation, you know, just sealing your door jams. It could be solar. It could be um, um, you know, changing your light bulbs out, low flow shower, shower uh, heads. But they have done an amazing job. And uh, they did it, when I first moved here three and a half years ago, one of the first things I did, and they came out and did an audit for my place. And I've got solar panels now, and I've just finished a major insulation upgrade, and uh, I've got a rainwater system at my house. But there's, there's the, the savings, like I said, an average of 500 bucks a year in utility bills. But it's also a mindset when someone is thinking, understanding the difference in, in, in consumption and conservation. Now, when it comes to landlords, can anyone tell me what the biggest problem is with a landlord wanting to, a uh, rental landlord wanting to um, do any upgrades for their house? There's always going to be demand for it whether they do or not. Say that again? There's always going to be demand for the house whether they do or not. That's a good one, right? And then, which is the, the, the tangent to that is what? what how, what's the relation between the, the landlord and the, and the tenants, right? The tenants don't see the, I mean, they see the benefit that the landlord technically doesn't think he sees it and then maybe a six or seven year payback versus, you know, instantaneously. So there's a disconnect, the people that live in the house and the people that, that pay for the house, okay? So we're trying to close that gap and that disconnect. This issue right here is the, the most inefficient uh, issue really when it comes to housing in, 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 the, in, in the, probably in the world because there's people that are, are, are suffering the effects of inefficient energy and consumption um, versus the people that are actually paying for it, okay? So I, I went through this as far as who pays, and um, can somebody give me an idea about how long you're gonna stay in one place? One year, two years, three years? I mean, is it normally, unless there's something egregious that happens, you stick, stick around in your, in your house? I would say most people move. They do? Every year. It's Every year. Why is that? Because they go home in the summer, or because they, because it's just the landlord sucks, or what is it? Landlord sucks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Your roommates too, like, might just want different situations, or like, it might be hard to keep the same group of people for fair enough. A bunch of years. Like, I got. Mean, I lived in the same place for three years, but like, I don't think everybody does that. Okay. Okay. Um, so, I, how do you communicate? I mean, I have gone on your. You know, I know there's several uh, housing sites on your. Um, on the university website. How do you communicate? Is it just word of mouth? Is that it? I mean, this place, that place, um, who's good, who's bad, landlord wise? Yeah, Craigslist basically. Craigslist. Just so, whatever's cheapest on Craigslist. Yeah, so you don't know. You gotta, you gotta find someone to live there, right? So, yeah. Sorry? Like all the companies are crappy. <laughs> Easy now. I mean, I have one, I have one place that, you know, my, my own landlord, my place is nice. Um, yeah, so there's an issue of multiple multiple landlords too, right? I mean, someone's got 10 properties and they go ahead and they've got a, a, a property management company, so you're not dealing with the landlord, okay? You're dealing with the property management. You know, I, I have to say, I spent the first two years that I was living on camp, or off of campus, I spent with a landlord through Landmark, and I never met them or knew who they were or spoke to them at all. The last three years I've been living in a house um, with a landlord who I just got the house because it drove by and there was a sign out front and it's been a much better experience to have a personal relationship with the landlord and we've had probably six or seven people come and go through the house over those three years but it's never been an issue just because we've been on really good terms with the landlord and it's been a huge difference. Yeah, I think that's helpful. I mean, I have this philosophy or this theory that says the farther away you get from your money, right, or your property, the worse off the environment which means if you're one step removed, I mean, I've got a whole section on social capital in my thesis about what that means and making decisions based on local community social capital. And that's when I moved here, and for example, started to get to know the guys' sustainable connection and their philosophy. I was just blown away because I was writing about that down in Humboldt 
and, and they couldn't implement it for a variety of reasons. But come up here and, and watch the stuff that they've done and allow you to make those decisions based on various parameters. Well, the reason I ask that is because you know, if you can vote with your dollars, economics is all about information, right? You can talk about all your economics curves, but if you can get quality information about what your, um, about what your choices mean and, and how to make your choices, obviously that would be good, correct? And if you could do that under your rules, meaning your rules as students, that's even more important, would you agree? See everybody down their head? Okay. So, because my idea here is, you know, how to, how to create a model that's by students. If I come in and say, oh, here's this wonderful model, I think you guys should go ahead and make your decision based on that. Well, that's no credibility. I'm not a student, um, and I don't have any skin in the game, so to speak. So, my idea, or my, my, my wish is to create a model that allows students to do a lot of this methodology up front, but able to pass this information along to ongoing students and educate them really rapidly on what their choices mean. And if you're looking for housing, if you could go on there and let me paint, let me, let me paint a little picture here. You can go on there and, and see a sustainability rating based on X, Y, and Z parameters that other students have worked on and continually refine over time. Wouldn't that be powerful when you're looking at property? When you're looking at say, look, here's the rent, here's the location, okay, I went to look at it, there's 50 other people here, you know. Um, and that will start to, it, it, incidentally, that will start to reward the people that are really doing positive things in the community because you're just you're making your choices based on the you know, whole picture uh, of, of, uh, of your rental property. So I put this slide in here uh, about economic and educational research. And I used to go toe to, not toe to toe, it's not true, but I used to have a dialogue with my economics professor in, in, in grad school because he walked through the models, the financial models and, and market models and all that. And I'd always say, you know, that's not reality. You know, that's, that's your model. That's not really what happens. So there is always the negative, you know, you can always poke holes in, in academic, or, uh, academic research. But when you go through that academic research, it, re it gives yourself a baseline to really make a strong argument one way or the other. So going through this academically, a process like this, um, gives any mo model you might put out there much more value um, because you have that confidence. Like, I had these ideas before grad school, and I was like, well, I kind of think it'll work. And then all of a sudden, I went through and, and, and brought it to fruition through the academic um, uh, environment. And so it's, it is important to, to go about it. That's why having somebody, you know, in maybe a, a school project or whatever, you get your professors to sign off on that stuff, it carries a lot of weight within the community. I mean, a, a, academia is so important in trying to, uh, in trying to, to bless certain models of So let's talk a little bit about, did, did everyone fill your things out? Did you, did the you last page? You did it? Did you take one second to do it? Or one than one, maybe three sips of coffee for me? And uh, circle, you know, three, um, top three, um, you think is valuable, and then pass them on down, and one of you folks over there want to volunteer to, to uh, count them for me, anybody? You want to volunteer? What do I do? Just I want you. I'm gonna pass them down there. I want you to tally them. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah, just in general, which who gets the most top three votes? Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about like, the possibilities and intentions, and and the, the intentions here is really putting together a, an interactive kind of a Yelp, for better lack of a better term, uh, for the, the, the academic community here. And, and you know, idea, ideally you'd love to be able to, to, to have it spread to anyone in the community, but does, it, does anyone have a question about you know, the value and the empowerment of what you guys have in your hands as far as how you make your decisions with your housing? Did I did I sell you enough on that as far as how I mean sixty three million dollars a year is it's one percent of the GDP here. It's about I mean from a rent, from a housing standpoint, you guys own the rental housing and no pun intended, but you you are the dominant force in the rental housing in Bellingham. And so that piece is, you know, really important. And if you can figure out a way to communicate amongst yourselves 
and then and thus be able to eventually communicate that with the rest of the, of the community. Do, would you all agree that's pretty powerful? Uh, can anyone give me an idea how we'd be able to pull that off? Just throw it out there. I won't critique it. Maybe a, maybe some sort of website. It seems to be the uh, well. This, these guys that these guys at the this Rent Rocket they have a website. They've tried that on universities campuses around the country. Um, but that particular um, website, I mean, think about it. It's it, well, first of all, it's only energy efficiency based. It's only based on your the bills that you the amount of money that you're paying monthly for your for your for your um, utility bills. So that's it. So what I'm saying with this little questionnaire, the reason I. Uh, Send it out is that who's someone give me a definition of sustainability? Come on, give it a go. What it means, what does that mean to you? Uh, to, to me, kind of a, a cycle of reuse, uh, you know, just to keep something going rather than having to bring in extra resources. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's a very broad term, and that you know, that's a that's a, 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 good, a good answer. Um, it, it really is based on in people's definition. You know, for some people, sustainability means like, oh, it could just keep going, right? Uh, or it means that it could be. Some people think it's, uh, you know, Native Americans think it's, you know, being able to uh, provide for um, having the same opportunity seven generations ahead of your generation. So, from a sustainability index, um, my my point in this whole discussion is, it would be up to you to decide. You know, call it sustainability. You can call it whatever you want. Call it a wellness index if you. But it's, you're saying as students, this is what's most important to me. And you're going to have people on the spectrum. You're going to have a freshman on the spectrum that is just doesn't care. They just want to see you know, where they can live near campus for the cheapest amount of money and bike, bike to school. Right? But then there's someone that says, well, I want to make this my mission to learn you know, what my impacts are based on my decisions. And I want to go to my parents and say, mom, dad, you give me 400 bucks a month for rent, okay? Here's this site that I can send you a link to. Here's this, this house that I'm looking at. And their sustainability index is 95 versus an average of 50. How about you giving me 50 more bucks a month for my, for my housing to pay for something that's, that's more valuable to the community and for me? And I'm making this decision, an adult decision, based on these parameters. Now, I, I, parents, that, parents that pay for your school who thinks your parents would buy into that argument? Yes or no? I don't see too many. Why well, you guys are bad salesmen? <laughs> <laughs> um, I know my dad would have. I mean, he, I was lucky enough. He paid for my college. He, I got out of there with no debt. Well, I had some loans, but, but that was the greatest gift he ever gave me. And then he said, you know, you're on your own from there. But if I would have went to him and said, you know what, Dad? I've looked at this, and this is this represents my values, and this is my impact on the community, and I think it was. I should pay more for this. He would, he would buy into it. And I think if you make that reason argument. So what I'm trying, again, what I'm trying to, to accomplish here today is I'm looking for a few people that want to be able to create a model. Probably be a year of time. It wouldn't be, much, it wouldn't be a lot of work. Um, we would direct you to find your money. Uh, and we'd, we'd show you a way to, to create this. And you would come out of school with having had a really, really phenomenal project working with the, the Office of Sustainability here on campus, or with people in the community. You're going to learn as you're doing it. Not going to be a lot of time. In a perfect world, I get three, four of you folks that say they want to do it, and uh, we go recruit a professor that wants to get behind it as, as one of your economics classes or, uh, or one of your environmental studies classes. Uh, and you come out of that, um, we probably have to get it done by next summer to, to be able to get the students coming in. So as simple as what it would look like is you're coming up with a student poll, you probably have to go for it. Well, I was going to say, since uh, uh, the um, amount of uh, uh, energy that the, the United States uses, how is that going to, it's not going to impact a lot what uh, Western students do. You know? so, what do you mean? I'm like, what's the point of like, um, trying to uh, reduce like, uh, like climate change? even though he has little impact in terms of like what's happening in the world? Uh, well, a couple things how it would impact. Number one, uh, well, first of all, there's the obvious carbon 
reduction. If, if, if you choose, if you choose, you know, your you know, energy is one of the issues. There's a, there's an obvious carbon, um, there's an obvious carbon impact. Okay. So the one go back to this. If you look, you know, 2.2 uh, metric tons of greenhouse gas emission reduction per year. And that's for here. Now, if you want to make a change anywhere, you got to start small, in my opinion. Okay. And from a college student standpoint, let's face it. College students will jump on the latest trend and take advantage of it. If you can create a model here that works, that people are, are using, student population is using, uh, it's very simple to take that very same model and, and, and translate it to other college campuses. This rent rocket these folks did, the problem that they, that they had, I think, this, this rent rocket is they, everyone wants to make it like either, a, either some brand new money making scheme or make it go too big. If you create something here that people can look at, can validate, and can uh, uh, see that the student population is using it, I guarantee every college campus will take off on that. If you make it really simple. So if you look at that in aggregate, all right, if we have $63 million a year here, pick a number, 1,000 college campuses, it's pretty large. And again, my, my, my mentality here, or my, my methodology is, you're taking control of the impact that you have on the community and the power that you have, and you're not ignoring that power. You're actually harnessing that power, and you're taking that that fire hose of money that you're pouring into the community, and you might just be redirecting it a little bit. Just somewhere that you, that you all agree is valuable. Let me go back to where I was there. Um, so, so you know in. Before we start doing some more question and answer, um, that's, again, that's my goal here. My goal is to find three students that say, you know what, we're going to take this on. We want to make it a project. Again, it's not a lot of time. Uh, I need the mojo of some folks in, in, in the, uh, I need students to help with this because I don't live on campus or off campus. I don't, I don't own or I don't rent in from anyone, and I don't live the life that you guys live. So are you hoping for like a green energy audit on all of the properties that students rent? Is that like what you're looking at? I'm, no, I'm hoping for exactly what I say I'm hoping for. I'm hoping for a system, a, a system that is vetted by the student population that says, here are the parameters that how we are going to rate off-campus housing. And you guys decide it. I don't care if you say that they've got to have you know, a kegerator in the basement, that's your number one thing. I have no idea. It's, the important thing is it's student run, student, the, the students decided, sanctioned by the university, and it's constantly reviewed. And you've got, like I said, you have the Office of, of Sustainability, and so we would be working with the Office of Sustainability to make this a, you know, an integral part of, the, of student life that they're making their decisions based on, um, on these parameters. And it's changeable and it's replicable. So, um, do you guys have some qu any more questions about how, what that would look like and time-wise and all that we're, we're talking about? So I, I think like, and this is attached to your question too, but like, how would the properties be assessed? Like, how would you figure out which of these properties like, is most sustainable? Like, are you going into these houses and being like, okay, there are double pane windows here, or like, <clears throat> okay, like, they have some sort of like renewable system, like, you know, they have a compost bin out back, or like, what would you be, how would you be like, getting that information? <clears throat> That's the then that's that's really the devil is in those details. You this is why putting a process in place. The hardest part is going to be, thank you. The hardest part is going to be. Um, um, oh, thanks. Uh, the hardest part is going to be uh, getting a system in place um, and getting the information. So you'd have to get basically uh, start getting a, um, a, a, a gathering information on addresses and so on and so forth. It's, it's going to be a lot of. Um, how would you say it, uh, um, less surveys. So the first thing you need to do is, is go on and, and you'd have to do a, it's pretty easy to do, you can do, this is again where you're learning as you go here, do a sampling, a certain amount of students. The sampling would be something like this. You know, what is the most important thing? You need to develop a rating system. Then the hard part begins, and this is where they're having it sanctioned within the, within the, uh, the um, um, university would be to create a model, I'm sorry, create a, uh, a data bank of, of information. So for example, every student has, has to fill out a simple questionnaire and it's sanctioned by the university. What's your address, X, Y, and Z? And then you got volunteers that 
put that data in a, into a, 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 data, a data system, and now you're creating a data bank of information. So that's all big data, easy stuff. It's like blocking and tackling of how you would do it. And then you have a web website that's populated that information, an interactive website. That's where the cost comes in. We gotta go find money for that. But that's a project that if you walk out of the university with a project under your belt there, I guarantee you, you're gonna have a job. Because you're like, I took this project from A to Z very quickly. Here's our results, here's our methodology, this is what we did here, and here's the results within the community. I mean, I, if I'm running a business, those people I'm gonna hire. So there's a double benefit there. Yeah. Sorry, just one more question. Keep going. It would rely on the honor system of people to accurately report that information. Yep. Yep. That's why it's gotta be student run. Because you're, you know, for the most part, you want to be in a range here, right? And you can, but it could be as easy as yes or no, right? Have they done, like I've said in here, have they done energy upgrades in the last five years? Yes or no? Do they, you know, do they have, you put chickens on your property, you know, if you want, whatever you decide, is there a garden space? So let's see here, we got, I'm going to read these off because I know we got to go in a second. Um, it looks like uh, the biggest ones, well, renewable energy is number one. Uh, I'm sorry, that's not true. Energy efficiency upgrades, community energy challenge number one. Renewable energy is number two, and then uh, the green waste uh, recycling is number three. Uh, number four is uh, landlord versus management companies. That's interesting because it's obviously pretty amazing to be able to speak to your landlord, like you said, when you guys talked about that versus a versus a management company. So, um, so. Um, we're getting close to the end here. Do you have any, first of all, any questions that I haven't answered that you want to throw out there? Okay. Okay, and then next, uh, I encourage you folks to, uh, um, let me give you my email address. So, um, if someone's interested. You can write it up on the board. Yeah, that's good. Idea. You get to see why I'm not a teacher. You see how I write up my board here. That case sensitive um, Yeah, so if you're interested in more questions, what it would look like, um, I'd love to get an idea, you know, next next month or so if someone's interested and we'd sit down with Seth and some other folks and um, anyone uh, anyone of you guys get a professor that you're interested in working with us and we put something together and put it into a project. Bob, good idea, and let's talk about it. Thank you, guys. Enjoy the rest of your semester.